Truly today we can say with the psalmist, this is the day the Lord has made. And may we with those people on that first Palm Sunday rejoice and be glad in what God has given us in the gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It certainly is amazing when you think about it how uh, things can change in a very short time. On that first Palm Sunday, shouts of Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Those shouts reverberated throughout the city of Jerusalem. And yet, as we all too well know, four days later, those same crowds were shouting, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! Yes, things certainly could change. But for a day, for that day, Christ was treated as the King He truly is. The multitudes who were gathered in Jerusalem had every reason to rejoice because the Savior had come. But as we all too well know, for most of them, their hope and their joy was in a king who would reign on earth over a physical kingdom. But knowing that, and in, in light of that, what about us? If they could rejoice and be glad over something that they misunderstood, a false hope and a false understanding of who this Jesus is, how much more? Ought we as the people of God who know who Jesus is and who know why He came, that He came to accomplish salvation for a sin-fallen world, how much more ought we as the people of God rejoice and be glad? Because He came to win salvation for us. He came to establish His kingdom in our hearts by grace through faith. He came to prepare us to enter one day into His heavenly kingdom. Some 500 years before Christ actually rode into Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah foretold the very events of that first Palm Sunday. And his words have been preserved for us on the pages of sacred Scripture to call out to us who are gathered in this place today and to all who will hear to call out, Rejoice! Your King is coming to you. Zechariah, the human author of our text, is known as the prophet of hope. And he prophesied at a time when the people of Israel didn't have much hope. About 79,000 Israelites had just returned from captivity in Babylon. And now they were returning to their homeland. They were to resettle the land, rebuild their homes, and rebuild the temple. But we also know from that history that even after their release, things for them were not easy. They didn't have an easy time of it. They struggled. They were disappointed oftentimes. They were frustrated uh, with what was going on in their lives. But it was to those struggling, frustrated people that God sent this prophet of hope to encourage them and to give them hope. He urged them to rebuild the temple as a reminder to them of the presence of God among them to prepare their hearts, to encourage them to receive that promised Messiah whom God said would come to redeem the world. So he calls out to these despondent, troubled people, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion! Shout for joy, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your King is coming to you. Now think about what they heard what when those words were shouted to them when Zechariah spoke them. Very clearly what Zechariah was reminding them of was the fact that they were God's people. They were the daughters of Zion, the daughters of Jerusalem. They were His redeemed people. They were the ones to whom the Messiah was going to come to redeem them. It meant that they were the ones who, to, who were to receive all of those promises scattered throughout the Old Testament that assured them that a Messiah, a Savior, was coming 
and that it was all theirs. So these words of encouragement and hope were to turn them from frustration to exaltation. Turn them from heaviness of heart to joy-filled hearts. They were to rejoice, to exalt, to tell others the good news that they had been told. The prophet says, your king is coming to you. That's what we want to look at this morning just briefly. What an incredible and what a special king he is. Zechariah in these words gives us a closer look at this king. Now certainly the nation of Judah was familiar with the concept of kings ruling over them. They had already passed through the period of the kings. But this king who was to come was not an ordinary king. This king was to be that long-awaited, the promised Messiah who would truly be the Savior King. It would be this One who would come who would deliver them from sin, from death, and from eternal condemnation. He would be the One who would establish His kingdom in their hearts by grace through faith and prepare for them an eternal kingdom. This King who was to come was to be the very Son of God. Of God. And Zechariah describes that king this way He is righteous and having salvation, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He tells us, first of all, that this king is righteous. Now, what does that mean? What concept comes to your mind when you hear that our king, Jesus, is righteous? It means that He is holy, and that He is just. It means that He is a, a ruler who treats all people equally. He rewards good, and He punishes evil. But the greatest thing, His being righteous, is climaxed in His act of proclaiming you and me, of proclaiming us righteous in His sight. We are justified, declared not guilty, in the sight of God because of this righteous King who was to come. By faith, His perfect righteousness becomes ours. Incredible King. That's your King and mine. He's described as having salvation. Now certainly this prophecy from Zechariah clearly has its fulfillment on Palm Sunday. But those words there, having salvation, uh, point out to us that included with Palm Sunday is everything that happened leading up to it. This whole week that we're going through to reenact it in a sense. Gethsemane, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday and the resurrection. Because it was only through that perfect life, that suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ that that salvation was accomplished. But it's interesting. He says having self, it's already there. Because when God makes a promise, those promises are as good as done. And that's the same for us. That righteousness, that salvation is yours. And it's mine because of that King who came. The King who is coming, the King who has come for us, is humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, if you were going to write this story of a king coming into Jerusalem, would you write this story picturing him coming in on a donkey? I don't think so. I think when I, if, if I were writing this story, he would be riding on a, uh, in proud splendor on a decorated and spirited war horse. Coming in on silver, of course I think of with the Lone Ranger, but he would be coming in, everybody would know that this was somebody that was important. But he was humble. And what does that point out to us? Jesus is a king whose greatness lies in this, that he came to serve. He came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. That's a pretty good king for us to have. He comes as a king of peace 
because he was the one who would establish peace between sinful mankind, between us, and a holy and a just and a perfect God. It's no wonder that Zechariah urges the people to rejoice and to shout for joy. And the good news for us, my friends, is that this same divine king prophesied by Zechariah, the same king who came on that first Palm Sunday, that same king continues to come to us yet today as our Savior and as our king. So that call of the prophet sounds down to us right here in this place, in this church right now. Rejoice! Be glad! Your King is coming to you. Think about how He comes to us. Think of the promise that the Savior has given. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always. So He comes to us as we gather here in this place. He assures us that He is with us so that we can sing our praises, our alleluias to Him. He comes to us in His Word and in the sacraments through those precious means of grace that He's given to His church through which He assures us of His presence, of His love. He comes to us in His Word. And what does He do? He offers us peace and love and hope and forgiveness. That's the power of the Gospel. Paul says in Romans 1, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And that Word is here with us. And Jesus is here with us because He is that very Word of truth. He comes in the sacrament again. We will be privileged to receive that very body and blood by which He accomplished salvation for us to assure us in the most personal and intimate way our sins are forgiven. And through that gift, He strengthens us in our faith. Yes, my dear friends, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King, God makes us His children. His children. We're not pieces of driftwood caught in the currents of life. In other words, we aren't people who go day to day with no purpose and no meaning in our life. Because we have a King, a Savior King, who has redeemed us and who has made us His children. We're not like leaves uh, that are twisted and thrown and blown away in the wind. We're not like a social security number, a few dots on a government card. Because our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly King, has come to us and has given Himself for us. Think about it. You can call yourself a child of the Heavenly Father. A child of God. We, my friends, are of the highest nobility possible. And that makes a difference in our lives. While we are here, living in this world, in this sin-fallen world, we are to live as God's children, as citizens of the kingdom of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because we know that someday we will live with Him in His eternal kingdom in heaven. So what does that mean for us as we live our life daily in this world? If we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our King, it means that we're not only pledging our allegiance to Him with our lips, saying, yes, I believe in Jesus, but it means that I, that we, will want to dedicate our lives anew to Him. We want to give to Him, to Jesus, the highest priority of our time, of our treasures, our possessions, and our abilities. It means that as He came to serve as one of His children, what do I want to do? I want to be an individual who serves God faithfully with my life and who serves others in praise and glory to God Himself. And so, As His children, we pray that He would give to us a greater measure of His Holy Spirit to renew our hearts and our minds to faithfully serve Him, to root out all selfishness so that I be the child of God that He wants me to be, that loves Him 
that loves others and serves faithfully. You know, as I thought about this call of the prophet to rejoice, your king is coming, uh, I thought about a Christmas carol or Christmas song that one of my favorites, I have a, I think I first had it on a, a cassette tape and now I've got it on a DVD, but it's by Evie. I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but it's beautiful Christmas songs. And it's a song that I, no doubt you may be sung here in church at one time, I don't know. Uh, Come on, ring those bells. Have you ever heard that one? Come on, ring those bells, light the Christmas tree. Jesus is the King born for you. Have you ever heard it? Raise your hand. Not the way I sing it, but the way it should be sung. Okay. Yeah. Jesus, but did you hear it? Jesus is the King born for you and me. And we are here today. How thankful as we begin this solemn Holy Week with this celebration of Palm Sunday that Jesus the King is here for us. And what an incredible, incredible King we have. We have a King who has set us free from the slavery of sin. We have a King who now rules in our hearts and sits on the throne in our heart and rules our lives through the power of His Gospel. That's the King that we need. A Savior King. And Jesus is that King. So my dear friends, as the cry goes out today, rejoice! Your King is coming to you. God's call to each of us is to open our hearts. Open your heart to receive Him into your life as your Lord and as your Savior. Serve Him with all your heart, with all your might, until that day when we'll be privileged to serve with Him in heaven. Because there, in the presence of the Lamb, in the presence of the King, in the mansions of heaven, there will join the angels in singing, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and power and glory and praise. And so today again, we praise Him from whom all blessings flow. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding, may it keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen.